I had seen the magic shop from afar several times. I had passed it once or twice, a shop window of alluring little objects, magic balls, magic hens, wonderful combs, ventriloquist dolls, the material of the basket trick, packs of cards that looked all right, and all that sort of thing. But never had I thought of going in until one day, almost without warning, Gip hauled me by the finger right up to the window, and so conducted himself that there was nothing for it but to take him in. I had not thought the place was there, to tell the truth. A modest-sized frontage in Regent Street, between the picture shop and the place where the chicks run about just out of patent incubators. But there it was, sure enough. I had fancied it was down nearer the circus or round the corner in Oxford Street, or even in Holborn. Always over the way and a little inaccessible it had been, with something of the mirage in its position. But here it was now, quite indisputably, and the fat end of Gip's pointing finger made a noise upon the glass. If I was rich, said Gip, dabbing a finger at the disappearing egg, I'd buy myself that, and that, which was the crying baby, very human, and that, which was a mystery and called, so a neat card asserted, buy one and astonish your friends. Anything, said Gip, will disappear under one of those cones. I've read about it in a book. And there, Dada, is the vanishing halfpenny. Only, they've put it this way up so as we can't see how it's done. Gip, dear boy, inherits his mother's breeding, and he did not propose to enter the shop or worry in any way. Only, you know, quite unconsciously, he lugged my finger doorward, and he made his interest clear. That, he said, and pointed to the magic bottle. If you had that, I said at which promising inquiry he looked up with sudden radiance. I could show it to Jesse, he said, thoughtful as ever of others. It's less than a hundred days to your birthday, Gibbles, I said, and laid my hand on the door handle. Gip made no answer, but his grip tightened on my finger, and so we came into the shop. It was no common shop, this. It was a magic shop, and all the prancing precedence Gip would have taken in the matter of mere toys was wanting. He left the burthen of conversation to me. It was a little, narrow shop, not very well lit, and the doorbell pinged again with a plaintive note as we closed it. For a moment or so, we were alone and could glance about us. There was a tiger in paper mache on the glass case that covered the low counter. A grave, kind-eyed tiger that waggled his head in a methodical manner. There were several crystal spheres, a china hand holding magic cards, a stock of magic fish bowls in various sizes, and an immodest magic hat that shamelessly displayed its springs. On the floor were magic mirrors, one to draw you out long and thin, one to swell your head and vanish your legs, and one to make you short and fat like a drought. And while we were laughing at these, the shopman, as I suppose, came in. At any rate, there he was behind the counter, a curious, sallow, dark man with one ear larger than the other, and a chin like the toe cap of a boot. "'What can we have the pleasure?' he said, spreading his long magic fingers on the glass case. And so with a start we were aware of him. "'I want,' I said, "'to buy my little boy a few simple tricks.' "'Lego domain?' he asked. "'Mechanical? Domestic?' "'Anything amusing,' said I. "'Um!' said the shopman, and scratched his head for a moment as if thinking. Then, quite distinctly, he drew from his head a glass ball. Something in this way, he said, and held it out. The action was unexpected. I had seen the trick done at entertainment endless times before. It's part of the common stock of conjurers. But I had not expected it here. <laughs> That's good, I said with a laugh. Isn't it? said the shopman. Gip stretched out his disengaged hand to take this object and found merely a blank palm. "'It's in your pocket,' said the shopman, and there it was. "'How much will that be?' I asked. "'We make no charge for glass balls,' said the shopman politely. "'We get them,' he picked one out of his elbow as he spoke. "'Free.' He produced another from the back of his neck and laid it beside its predecessor on the counter. Gip regarded his glass ball sagely, then directed a look of inquiry at the two on the counter, and finally brought his round-eyed scrutiny to the shopman who smiled. 